Columbus, Ohio, September 1974. 25-year-old James Thomas Stanley is afraid. His fears are such that he feels he must leave the state of Ohio forever. James says his goodbyes to his two daughters, his mother and father, and the rest of his family. On September 23rd, his vehicle is found abandoned along the northbound lanes of I-95 near Kenley, North Carolina. His keys and personal belongings have been left behind. No trace of James Thomas Stanley has ever been found. Forty-six years later, his family is still searching for answers. Thomas Stanley has been missing since 1974. There have been no reported sightings and no activity on his social security number. Fearful that his expressed concerns for his personal safety may have been justified, his family filed no missing persons report until 2007. James Stanley left behind a loving but confused family, including two young daughters none of whom could fathom why he would abruptly choose to up and drop from sight. Today, his daughters are adults and want desperately to know what happened to their father. This feature was filmed with the complete cooperation of James Stanley's family and the Athens County, Ohio Sheriff's Department. James Thomas Stanley, known to his family and friends as Tommy, was born in Ironton, Ohio in 1949. He was the youngest of three children born to James and Martha Stanley. Tommy spent most of his childhood in Nitro, West Virginia. Around 1963, Tommy and his parents moved to the Plains, Ohio, a small and mostly agrarian community in Athens County. According to his family, Tommy was less than happy about the move. James Stanley Sr. went to work for the Ohio State Highway Patrol, administering driving exams. He and his family settled into a modest home on East 4th Street in the Plains. In 1967, James Stanley graduated from the Plains High School, the last graduating class before the institution changed its name to Athens High School. Not long after graduation, Tommy married his high school sweetheart, Patricia Hillen. Together, Tommy and Patricia settled down and made a go at life. In July of 1968, Patricia gave birth to a daughter, Marie. To say that Marie was born during an interesting time period is perhaps the understatement of any century. 1968 is often remembered as the year that America was having a nervous breakdown. From beginning to end, the country seemed to be facing one major crisis after another. Vietnam, civil rights, the decay of the urban areas, and a sharp increase in violent crime led many to lament that America was in serious trouble. In the Plains, things were not going much better for Tommy and Patricia. Both were very young and by December, the strains of life had finally pulled them apart. Tommy was granted custody of Marie, and they moved back in with Tommy's parents on East 4th Street. Two years later, Tommy married again. However, the parents of his second wife, Gail E. Fink, were not at all happy with the arrangement and had the marriage annulled. Undeterred, Tommy and Gail simply snuck away to Kings Island near Cincinnati and got married again. This time, Gail's parents did not intervene, and she and Tommy soon had a daughter of their own. For the next two years, Tommy, Gail, and the two girls lived a somewhat transient existence. Marie recalls that at various times they lived in the Plains, Nitro, West Virginia, Columbus, 
and possibly even Tennessee. Wife Gale recalls that at one time, Tommy was the manager of an Arthur Treacher's Fish and Chips, and later drove a delivery van for a produce company in Columbus. Marie vividly recalls being given rides in her father's delivery vehicle every morning. At the time, Tommy and his family resided in an apartment complex near the Northland Mall on Columbus's north side. Sadly, by the end of 1972, Tommy's second marriage was also on the skids. Eventually, he and Gail were also divorced, and Tommy soon found himself faced with an agonizing decision. Confronted with continuing financial woes and the uncertainty of being a single parent, Tommy concluded that Marie would be far better off living with someone else. Fortunately, although Marie had to be parted from her father, she did not have to leave the family. Marie was legally adopted by Tommy's older sister, Dee, and her husband, Don Carnes. Marie soon went to live with them at their home in Nitro. She recalls that Tommy visited her there frequently and was never truly out of the picture. Tommy remained in Ohio and attempted to get his life back on track. He continued driving a produce vehicle and by 1974 had taken up residence in a small apartment on Columbus's east side. According to Tommy's family, his daughters, although far from his sight, were never far from his mind. Tommy's life in Columbus during this period remained something of an enigma. He maintained contact with his family, but did not often speak about his day-to-day -day existence. What is known is that by August of 1974, his financial woes had returned, and he was having difficulty making child support payments to Gail for his younger daughter. No one knows precisely what triggered it, but by September of 1974, Tommy had decided that he needed to leave Ohio and perhaps his entire life behind. Whatever the reason, his decision must have been a sudden one, as he never picked up his last paycheck from the produce company, nor a settlement check owed him from an auto accident earlier in the year. Tommy packed his belongings into his car and made the rounds to his various family members, advising them that he was leaving Ohio for good and had no intention of returning. Some recall that he mentioned he was bound for Florida, possibly to meet up with a high school friend nicknamed Hollywood. While in Nitro, Tommy stopped at his sister's home to bid Marie farewell. As a parting gift, he presented her with a bracelet engraved with her name and the words, Love, Daddy, September 1974. Tommy told Marie the bracelet was a present for her birthday. When she replied that her birthday was in July, Tommy stated it was because he probably would never see her again. Tommy was last known to have stopped at his younger sister Linda's home in Beckley, West Virginia. If his destination was indeed Florida, he was on the correct southerly route following the West Virginia Turnpike. It is believed that Tommy left West Virginia on or about September 18, 1974. His family has not seen nor heard from him since. Five days after Tommy is believed to have left Ohio, an unusual event occurred. Tommy's green 1969 Fiat Spider was found abandoned along the northbound lanes of Interstate 95, about four miles south of the town of Kenley, North Carolina. Trooper A.W. Williams with the North Carolina State Highway Patrol responded to the call concerning Tommy's vehicle. He found the vehicle abandoned but reportedly undisturbed. According to later conversations with Tommy's family, Trooper Williams reported that the keys were still in the ignition and the doors were unlocked. Trooper Williams estimated that Tommy's car had sat at the location where it was found for about two days before it was reported. Some websites currently state that Tommy's wallet was among the items recovered. However, during a recent interview with Dee and Don Carnes, both were fairly certain that Trooper Williams made no mention of Tommy's wallet or driver's license having been present in the abandoned vehicle. 
Finding no evidence of foul play, Trooper Williams arranged for the vehicle to be towed to Holland's Garage, now Holland's Salvage, in nearby Kenley. Closer inspection revealed that a radiator hose was broken, suggesting that the vehicle had likely overheated and simply given out. Fearful for both his safety and privacy, Tommy's family and friends had not reported his disappearance to law enforcement. His vehicle, therefore, would not have shown up in any system as either missing or stolen. This letter, sent to Tommy's own residence as well as his parents, is one of the few surviving official documents pertaining to his disappearance. It indicates that the state of North Carolina pursued the matter long enough to at least assign a file number to Tommy's case. Tommy's vehicle is listed as a 1969 Fiat, Serial number 100-GBS-006-0249, Ohio license plate number X1798H. Tommy's address is given as 12 and a half Chicago, Apartment 2, Columbus, Ohio. It is not known if this address was taken from Tommy's vehicle registration, insurance papers, or from some other source. Curiously, the date on the letter indicates that it was mailed a full month after Tommy's vehicle had been found and placed into storage. The reason, if any, for the delay is not known. Upon learning that Tommy's vehicle had been located, his brother-in-law, Don Carnes, along with a friend, drove to Holland's Garage in Kenley, North Carolina. However, one day prior to their arrival, Tommy's vehicle was picked up by the company through which it was financed, the Beneficial Finance Corporation, and transported to their Winston-Salem office. Further complicating the issue, many of Tommy's personal effects were curiously unaccounted for. Don Carnes later recalled that the sum total of his efforts to retrieve Tommy's belongings amounted to some clothing stuffed into a duffel-type bag, a pair of shoes, a shaving kit, a toothbrush, and a stack of eight-track audio tapes. No wallet, no driver's license, no personal papers, not even the photo albums which contained the childhood photos of his two daughters. Holland's Garage was contacted by Mysterious WV, and they agreed to check their files to see if any documentation on Tommy's vehicle had survived. Unfortunately, a great many of their records had been destroyed in a flood and no documentation could be located. According to information gleaned from Trooper Williams, Tommy's vehicle was found in this general area, approximately four miles south of Kentley. The vehicle was reportedly located alongside the northern lanes of Interstate 95. I-95 is now the principal north-south artery for much of the east coast. However, in 1974, I-95 actually terminated on the southern border of Kenley, as can be seen in this aerial photograph taken in January of 1975. Just how had Tommy's car, and presumably Tommy himself, gotten from here in Beckley to here in Kenley, a location which was not along the direct southern route from West Virginia and Ohio to Florida? As is the case today, the most logical route in 1974 would have been for Tommy to follow the West Virginia Turnpike and I-77 to Columbia, South Carolina, and only then transition to I-95. If Tommy's ultimate destination was Florida, and he had simply chosen an alternate route, why then was his vehicle found along the northbound lanes of I-95 as opposed to the south? Had Tommy changed his mind and chosen another destination? If so, where and why? Very little about the situation seemed to make any sense. As Tommy had made it plain that he had, in essence, packed up his life and left Ohio, the unusually small amount of recovered possession struck his family members as particularly odd at best. Also, it was ascertained that Tommy's 1969 Fiat Spider was later purchased by a member of the Beneficial Finance Corporation. 
Just what became of Tommy's missing personal possessions is unknown. The confusion and frustration over the vehicle soon led to another, far more serious question. What had become of Tommy? Still fearful for his well-being and safety, members of Tommy's family undertook a search on their own. They again traveled to Kenley, North Carolina, and blanketed the small town with flyers, like this one. Despite their efforts, no additional information concerning Tommy's fate or location was forthcoming. In a cliché sense, it was as though he had simply up and dropped off the face of the earth. As with many missing persons cases, the most perplexing of all questions is why. Why had James Thomas Stanley abruptly chosen to up and leave his life and family behind? Some, including members of Tommy's family, have speculated that his decision to leave may have been out of fear of legal action concerning his delinquent child support payments. Shortly before his departure, a minor vehicular violation created a situation where Tommy would be required to appear in court. It is possible that Tommy feared such an appearance would bring the issue of his delinquency to a head, an issue which could have resulted in his being sent to a work farm. Tommy never did appear in court. However, it should be noted at this point that no one, law enforcement or otherwise, ever contacted Tommy's family in an attempt to locate him. Had a bench warrant or some other kind of decree been issued, it would have been no trouble at all for the authorities to locate and contact Tommy's parents. If Tommy had truly been in some kind of trouble, it seemed that it had either diffused itself or, perhaps, had never existed. Weeks passed, then months, then years. The 1970s gave way to the 1980s, and still, no word from Tommy and no additional information concerning his disappearance. Life went on, and memories began to fade. In 1981, Tommy's second wife, Gail, had him declared legally dead in order to free up Social Security benefits for his youngest daughter. Tommy's loss had taken a toll on his family, and the subject was not a frequent topic of conversation. Daughter Marie, by now a teenager, knew the subject was not one to be brought up. Still, her curiosity gradually got the best of her. Around 1987, Marie, not wanting to reopen old wounds, began making discreet inquiries. Marie was able to locate and speak with several of Tommy's former friends and classmates. One of Tommy's closest friends, the man previously referred to only as Hollywood, had lived in Florida at the time, and recalled that Tommy had contacted him and stated that Florida was his ultimate destination, but that he never arrived. Neither Marie's birth mother, Patricia, nor any residents of the Plains were able to shed any additional light on the reason behind Tommy's sudden flight. Tommy's parents, James and Martha, passed away in 1995 and 1996, respectively. Not long after their passing, Marie began her search for Tommy in earnest, reaching out to every agency and family member she could think of, including the Doe Network, the Charlie Project, the Athens County Sheriff's Department, and even the FBI. In 2001, Marie commissioned the production of this age-progressed sketch, showing what Tommy might have looked like at the age of 52. Sadly, the photos used for the sketch, as well as the original sketch itself, were later lost in the mail. In 2007, Marie was encouraged by the FBI to file an official missing persons report to help cut through the red tape associated with her search. Thirty-three years after he dropped from sight, James Thomas Stanley was finally declared a missing person. The details of his case have since been entered into the NamUs system, and DNA has been obtained from both Marie and Tommy's oldest sister, Dee. Several potential matches have already been compared and excluded. This John Doe, with whom Marie's DNA was compared in 2007, at first appeared to be a very likely prospect. 
However, following the DNA analysis, it was determined that this unfortunate young man found in Georgia in 1975 was not Tommy Stanley. Today, Tommy's case is being handled by the Athens County, Ohio Sheriff's Department. They, along with Marie, are in the process of attempting to gain access to Tommy's financial and employment history from the Social Security Administration. They are hoping to possibly locate former co-workers and friends of Tommy's who may have known him during the time that he was living and working in Columbus. Forty-six years have come and gone since James Thomas Stanley was last seen by his family. Though the chances seem slim, those who love and miss Tommy are continuing in their search for answers. Although she has been successful in having Tommy's case re-examined by law enforcement, the results thus far are not what Marie Carnes had been hoping for. Since 2007, very little in the way of new information has come to light, and at this point, time is certainly not a friendly companion. Precious weeks were lost in 1974, and with each passing day, the search becomes more difficult. Despite the odds, Marie Carnes remains undeterred. If indeed her father is alive, then she longs for the day when she can once again put her arms around him and introduce him to his grandchildren. If Tommy is passed on, then Marie wants nothing more than to return his mortal remains to Ohio, where they can be laid to rest alongside his parents. James Thomas Stanley was last seen by his sister, Linda, in Beckley, West Virginia, on or about September 18, 1974. During the previous days, he had advised his family that he was fearful for his well-being and was en route to Florida, possibly with the intention of visiting a high school acquaintance nicknamed Hollywood. Tommy was last known to have been living at 12 and a half Chicago Avenue in Columbus, Ohio. At the time, he was driving a delivery truck for a produce company and generally began his workday around 4 a.m. Unfortunately, none of Tommy's family can recall the name of the produce company. Tommy's vehicle, a green 1969 Fiat Spider convertible, serial number 100GBS0060249, Ohio license plate number X1798H was found alongside the northbound lanes of Interstate 95, approximately four miles south of the small community of Kenley, North Carolina. The vehicle was discovered by North Carolina Highway Patrolman A.W. Williams. Williams estimated that the vehicle had sat alongside the highway for approximately two days before it was discovered. Williams reportedly advised Tommy's family that there were no signs of a struggle and that the keys were still in the ignition and the doors unlocked. Tommy's personal possessions, including clothes, shoes, a shaving kit, a toothbrush, and boxes of photo albums were also present. The vehicle was towed to Holland's Garage, now Holland's Salvage, in Kenley, where it remained for just over one month. Tommy's family was notified about the vehicle's discovery in a letter from the North Carolina Highway Patrol dated October 24, 1974. The vehicle was removed from Holland's garage by the Beneficial Finance Corporation before Tommy's family could inspect it. Many of Tommy's personal possessions were never recovered. Some of the items which were recovered included a few articles of clothing, a pair of shoes, a shaving kit, a toothbrush, and a stack of eight-track cassette tapes. Holland's Garage has been unable to locate any paperwork concerning Tommy's vehicle. Authorities, as well as Tommy's family, would be most interested in speaking with anyone who may have known or worked with Tommy during the time he was living in Columbus. In particular, anyone who may be able to recall the name of the produce company for whom Tommy worked just prior to his disappearance. They would also like to speak with anyone who may have seen or spoken with Tommy or observed his vehicle at the time it became disabled along the northern lanes of I-95 south of Kenley, 
an event which is believed to have occurred on or about September 21st, 1974. Today, James Thomas Stanley would be 71 years old. He is approximately 5 feet 8 inches tall with blue eyes and a fair complexion. In 1974, he weighed 140 pounds and had light brown to blonde hair, sometimes described as sandy. He wore a partial upper dental plate and has a scar from either a hernia or an appendectomy operation on his left side. His left arm was broken in 1965. If you have any information concerning the whereabouts or the disappearance of James Thomas Stanley, please contact the Athens County, Ohio Sheriff's Department at 740-593-6633. Thank you.